Ben, from Canada Day through August 16th, so that's a month and a half, Blue Jays went 21 and 20. They had a plus 39 run differential. We were thinking, hey, the worst is behind us. May is gone. They can't hurt us anymore. The Blue Jays are turning this thing around. They're starting to look a lot more like something close to a competitive ball club. One game over 500 over that 41 game stretch, a good run differential. So what's happened since then? Club has gone three and 12 with a minus 40 run differential. Which is the real Blue Jays or is it somewhere in between? Yeah, I mean, usually when it comes to this kind of extreme runs, probably somewhere in between, but it is a reminder that this is not a 500 team right now. Um, and even though they might play like a 500 team when they're playing their very best baseball of the year, that this team also has the potential to play way below that. And it is kind of crazy to think that that 21 and 20 run where they were, you know, just firing on all cylinders and everything was going right. And they are a 500 team yeah. for a quarter of the season. So a reminder that they have a lot of work to do. They're firing on most of their right. cylinders. On all the cylinders they have, like, <laughs> which isn't necessarily a ton. They were firing on like 51% of their cylinders, yeah. uh, which, which put them a game over 500. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder if this run since then, it's at the letters, by the way, brought to you by the all-new 2019 Ford Ranger. And he's Ben Nicholson-Smith, and I'm Arden Zwelling. And I'm wondering if that run of 3-12, and 12, like the schedule's gotten rougher. They're playing Houston, four against Atlanta, Tampa Bay Rays. Like They're playing tough teams. The schedule's been tougher than it was prior. But I just wonder if that 3-12 and 12 run kind of puts a bit of a damper internally on the progress that the Blue Jays were thinking that they had made over that midseason stretch where they were looking a lot better. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly wouldn't help morale or it certainly wouldn't move the needle closer to contention. Um, my sense is that the Blue Jays tend to zoom out even more than we do and that they look at this much more on a month-to-month, season-to-season basis. And right. so a 3-12 and run isn't going to leave Ross Atkins and Joe Sheehan devastated in the front <laughs> office. Ben Charrington hopefully isn't throwing ten- temper tantrums over the 3-12 the and run. It's just part of a losing season. I think that... You know, more realistically, it's it's a reminder um, for fans and certainly for people internally, probably for the coaching staff, they would feel this and the players would feel this. Um, but it's a reminder that there is a lot of work to do. And I think most of that exists on the pitching side, as we've been saying all year. I mean, it's, yeah. it's pretty obvious, right? But of course we're going to say it. It's, it's a huge part of what remains ahead for this team as they try to become a contender again. And the thing is, it's not going to get any easier from here, like you look at the upcoming series, series that the Blue Jays have, they're going to St. Petersburg for four games with the Tampa Bay Rays. It's a which, tough team. And a tough building yep. for this team historically. And then you come home to play Boston, who aren't a playoff team, but have one of the best offenses in baseball. And you just mentioned that pitching is a big weakness on this team. And then you got the Yankees coming into town, and they've already got over 90 wins. And you get like a l- three-game set against Baltimore, and it's the Yankees again <laughs> in the Bronx. Yeah. So... This, like, 100 losses is still very much on the table. Like, how demoralizing would that be? Just this amount of losing and just, you know, having one of the worst records in franchise history for a very young, developing team. Yeah, I think it would say something about this season as a whole. And it would be, you know, as we look back on it, you know, say in in a couple years, we'd be like, man, this team lost 100 games. You know, I can't believe it. Um, I'm sure for some fans it would be demoralizing. And I'm sure others just wouldn't care at all and probably have tuned out months months ago. Um, if you're still with it now, you're a diehard. Yeah. For sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's no question about that. I think for the players, I don't think they would care. Uh, yeah. I don't think – I think Charlie Montoya would care. Yeah. Um, I don't think he wants his first major league season to include 100 losses. So I think he would care and his coaches would care. But I don't think the players care at all. And I don't think the front office would care. It's just a round number. Yeah. And, like, if they lose 98 games – it's still been just as awful of a season yeah. <laughs> just because there aren't three digits in the loss column. Like it's still a failure of a season yeah. and it's still one of the worst seasons in franchise history and people should look at it as such. Um, and you can pull out those kind of fragments like that mid season stretch that we've been talking about where, yeah, they looked great, you know, and like Brandon Drury was on a hot streak and Teoscar Hernandez was, was on a tear and you had young players coming up and looking good. 
but it's a 162 game schedule. It's a six month thing. You can look good for six weeks and we're seeing now it really doesn't make that much of a dent in your overall season. So I'm just kind of, you know, when I talk about this team, like I think about, you know, well, I feel like the worst is behind us and I feel like they're kind of on the upward way of like the inverse parabola of getting out of this rebuild. Uh, but I also wonder if maybe I'm overrating them a little bit and maybe they're actually further away from not only like contention, but even being like a 500 team next year than I'd previously thought. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, when you look at the last stretch, it's, uh, it's been, it's been tough. I still think that, you know, if, if they make a couple additions to the pitching staff, they probably project as a 78 win team and, you know, maybe a little bit more upside depending on who they add on the pitching side. Do you think they um, could go from, so say they win like 65 yeah. this year, do you think they could really add 13 wins yeah, next year? I think so. Yeah. And I mean, some of that would be, this year has been a year of opportunity. And so that that means that the Blue Jays have given opportunities to players who have since proven that they did not necessarily deserve <laughs> those opportunities. So you look at whoever it is, let's pick on Socrates Brito again, because he's he had a rough year. Yeah. We, we de definitely um, <laughs> haven't piled on him. Yet, I think know. he was the Bison's MVP. By he the was, yeah. yeah. And he's uh, Rule 5 eligible. Doesn't you know, Jays will probably not protect him, I would think, in the Rule 5 draft, nope. from what uh, we understand. So he'll probably be gone. Um, or, well, no one's going to claim. Well, that's, that's not the point. The point is, the Blue Jays gave playing time to people like Socrates Brito, who put up negative war. And actively hurt the team with their performances. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of pitchers. If you look at the Blue Jays baseball reference page or the Blue Jays fan graphs page, there are a lot of pitchers in the negatives this year. And so I think that they can make a certain amount of improvements just by not giving opportunities to as many pitchers Sorry. who are going to post negative wars. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not to say that they're going to have all guys in the positives. They're going to have pitchers who struggle again in 2020. But it's not going to, they're not going to give as many opportunities to those pitchers who actively hurt them. I was so mad at your Socrates Brito slander that I threw <laughs> my pen at you. Uh, he had only 43 plate appearances for this team. Mm -hmm. So, like, and I get it. They were bad plate appearances. Yeah. They weren't good. But, you know, we pick on Socrates Brito a lot. Alan Hansen had 48 plate appearances wow. for this team. He had more. And Socrates Brito and Alan Hansen didn't go to AAA and win an MVP. He actually was released. That's how bad he was for this club. So I wonder if maybe we should, you know, Alan Hansen should be the whipping boy more so. But also, like, look, you subtract two guys who had fewer than 50 plate appearances, fine. And if you give those plate appearances to, you know, a player that you feel better about going forward, great. But that's only 50 plate appearances, not even. Right. So you do have a it's lot. It's not of even 100, like, accumulatively. But I'll, I'll just read you a few names here, okay? <laughs> so Edwin Jackson. If the Blue Jays do things right this offseason, they should have better alternatives than Edwin Jackson. Sure. Both at AAA and in the major leagues. It shouldn't be that hard. He posted negative 1.6 war. Socrates Brito, negative 0.7. Alan Hansen, negative 0.6. Thomas Pannone, negative 0.5. I just don't think that we're going to see as many players perform as poorly and continue to get chances. Edwin Jackson was abysmal even in his own words and you know this is not a nothing personal against Edwin Jackson but he did not perform no. and he admitted as much and he kept getting chances because this team had nothing no because they didn't have a rotation yeah and they didn't they went most of the season without a ro like when you look at it like I would think the majority of the season the Blue Jays did not have a full rotation oh yeah by far <laughs> yeah which is the problem yeah yeah you want you want to have eight good starting pitchers not two and a half or three or four or couple openers and Wilmer Fonts now second on this team in starts because they just have not had stability in the rotation all year. We're going to look at some of the uh, starting pitchers who are making their big league debuts after this on At The Letters. This is At The Letters brought to you by the all new 2019 Ford Ranger with the available terrain management system which automatically calibrates engine responsiveness, transmission gearing, and vehicle control systems to provide the optimum traction, drivability, and performance. TJ Zoic makes his big league debut uh, in Atlanta on Tuesday. Ben, your thoughts on how things went for young TJ? You know, I think, I think it was a fun debut. It's... Uh nice for him definitely to make it to the major leagues and after three years in the minors um and including a no hitter that that he pitched last month 
um, have the chance to pitch against a very good Braves offense. And he gave them four innings, allowed a couple runs. I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that you look at this as an overwhelming success, but to be honest, Zoic just doesn't profile as the kind of pitcher who's going to shut down lineups. He's no. going to have to have help from his defense, and that's that seems to be who he is as a starting pitcher. So a few thoughts. I'll start with, I don't think that TJ Zoic had his best command on the night. Uh, he threw some good sinkers down the zone, but the slider was up too much, and Josh Donaldson got him on a slider that was up. The, the hitters are better here, right? So you don't get away with those mistakes uh, as often as you do in the minors, particularly not against Josh Donaldson, who's having a remarkable season. He's one of the best hitters in baseball. So you leave a slider like that up, you're going to get hurt. Other than that, he was okay. But in my opinion, the Blue Jays did not put TJ Zoic in the best position for success hmm. because they had him pitch behind an opener. So, okay, what are your thoughts on that? So Wilmer Font coming into the game had been great as an opener for the Blue Jays. Uh, you know, it was something like 19, 17 and a third innings, 1-5-6 ERA, 27 to 6 strikeout to walk yep. as an opener, Wilmer Font. That's terrific. That's great. But TJ Zoic is coming up to make his MLB debut. So it's already a nervous, anxious day. Like the heart rate is already elevated. He's already getting used to a lot of new things in the big leagues, new team, new, you know, how you prepare for starts. You know, they, they gave him Bo Taylor, who he'd been working with in AAA to, you know, make him maybe a bit more comfortable. That was nice. But it's already a bit of a foreign day. And then now he has to get ready to come in maybe to start the second maybe two outs in the second if things had gone better for Wilmer Font, which they didn't because he was getting hit around. He gave up hits to the first four batters he faced and was kind of lucky to get out of it because uh, Matt Joyce hit a liner right at Rowdy Tellez, double off Josh Donaldson at first. Why add that extra layer of uh, discomfort and that extra layer of something foreign to his day when he's been starting the entire season in his routine, with his preparations, getting ready to come in for the first inning at the beginning of a ball game. I don't understand why you would make things even more strange for him on a day like that. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely fair to say that that would uh, create different challenges for him, just as far as the timing. You, you know, uh, pitchers obviously habits are creatures of habit when it comes to their preparation. And so, you know, if you're used to going out there 30 minutes before first pitch, how do you make that mental adjustment or kind of translate that when, when you're going to be pitching behind an opener? So there would be some sort of extra thought that would go into it. Um, I think at the same time, like, if you're good enough to pitch in the major leagues and if you're, if you're truly going to succeed here, you should be able to succeed in different roles. I mean, Marcus Stroman came up and he pitched in relief, you know, after starting in the minor leagues. And How'd that go? Well, not, well. not great not as a well. reliever, but it didn't, it didn't, totally take his career out or Aaron Sanchez to use a different example came up and pitched in relief and he was really good in relief and then ended up going back to the rotation so I don't think it's the worst thing to put these guys in a different role but it's certainly you know to to come into the game you're already behind um, and against the tough Braves offense I can see how that would add a wrinkle in Zoig's case and the Blue Jays are clearly loving openers right now you know we're seeing it used a lot uh, and we're seeing them have success with it obviously I gave you fonts numbers and I understand the rationale that well if you know TJ Zoig can like start his outing against the bottom of the order maybe it's a you know it's a bit easier of a beginning and he avoids the first inning where OPSs are higher than they are in the rest of the innings and he faces a less challenging part of the lineup and if he turns it over three times He's turning it over with the bomb, the order. TJ Zoic was never going to turn the lineup over three times. He was going through yep. twice. Oh, yeah. And he was getting out of there. That would have been good. Like, two <laughs> times is good. That's right? a good outcome. And what the Blue Jays want from TJ Zoic eventually is for him to be a starting pitcher and a good one and a guy who can start a game. So why not just let him do that now? These final 22 games, whatever they are, you're evaluating, you're exposing guys to challenges at the big league level. Why not? Give him that opportunity in his first outing. What do you think? Um, what do you think TJ Zoic has a chance to be as a major league pitcher? Five and dive. Yeah, you know, yeah. probably profile like okay, most realistic scenario. Yeah, like he's Sam Cavilio, right? Like he's yeah. long guy righty out of the bullpen. That's almost a good outcome for the Jays <laughs> at this point. But the Blue Jays, you know, look, they spent a first round pick on yeah. him, big bonus. Yeah, they certainly hope that he can be better than that. And they want the best outcome, which would be he is an innings-eating starter in your rotation. They would love it if he could become a back-end number five starter. That would be 
a huge, huge 165 success. innings, oh, yeah. four ERA. They would love that. They would love that. Um, and you know, the one comp that you hear is Jake Westbrook, who is a ground ball guy with uh, Cleveland back in the day, and um, not necessarily a frontline starter, but someone who ate a lot of innings and you know, tall ground ball pitcher, Man. and someone who definitely added value in Cleveland. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah, we'll see if that's the case for Zoic. But, I, you know, the one thing that alarms me when it comes to his profile as a pitcher is just that he doesn't strike guys out. And we saw that last night. He got five swings and misses in the course of 75 pitches. And you look at guys in the league now who succeed with very few strikeouts. Um, often they are ground ball guys, which Zoic is. So yeah. you look at a guy like Brett Anderson. You look at a guy like Mike Leak. Um, Marcus Stroman even would fit that mold to an extent. Sure. Uh, Wade Miley, like these guys get a lot of ground balls and they're still successful, but it's really tough to do. And you have to be in the strike zone, but at the bottom of the strike zone, you can't leave pitches up over the plate like you observed with his slider uh, yesterday. So it, it's a tough kind of needle to thread there when it comes to pitching in the strike zone because you can't afford to walk guys, but also not leaving it up. And it requires really good command. So we'll see if Zoic can do that. I, I think the odds right now would be because he's he's not even striking out six per nine. He's striking yeah. out like four and a half per nine. I know. Even Mike Soroka, who is like similar sinker baller guy, doesn't strike a lot of guys out. His K per nine is seven. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's below average for yeah. Major League Baseball these Absolutely. days. But still. Um, yeah. And the thing about sinker ballers in today's game is everybody is swinging up and everybody yeah. wants to get a high launch angle on on the ball because ground balls are death. And fly balls are flying over the outfield walls at incredible uh, rates, rates that we have never seen before. A lot of the time, you just get the ball in the air and good things happen. So if you're a sinker, uh, if, you, if you're relying on a sinker and it's moving down like that, the batter's swinging up like this, like that's pretty direct contact. Um, so some, you have to be really fine with your command, with yeah. your location. Like you can't miss uh, like he was in his debut outing. Uh, but I also think he should have been allowed to start. Fair, yeah. And I think that Anthony Kay should be allowed to start when he comes up to pitch this weekend. Yeah, uh, and that's, I mean, that'll be that'll be against the Rays, um, you know, and that's a challenging lineup in some ways, but uh, but Kay has had a lot of success with the exception of his final AAA start, which wasn't good. He had a lot of success um, at Buffalo. And so this is someone who's, probably going to get a lot more strikeouts than Zoic. He's probably going to walk more guys too. So that's what we're looking at. Um, but I think it makes sense to take a look at him. And these guys, you know, in both cases, they're going to be on your 40 men anyway. So take a look, see what they can do. And, and maybe one of them or both of them can surprise us over the course of the final month of the year. Anthony K is going to be an interesting one because uh, obviously, you know, one half of the return from Marcus Stroman. And so there's going to be, you know, a lot of eyes on that. His performance is going to be under... Bit of a magnifying, magnifying glass, like, you know, fair or not. Uh, but a guy with some velocity, a guy who can strike people out, guy with a big break and curve ball, uh, but also a guy who had, like, a five walks per nine yeah. in AAA. And so if you want to, uh, like, like, ask Sean Reed Foley how that turns out <laughs> in the majors. If you come up and you're not throwing strikes, right? Yeah. Like, the hitters are better, man. Like, they, they got better strike zone discipline. The umpires are better. Right, like th that's a factor as well. The umpires like call balls and strikes much more consistently than they do in the minor leagues. Uh, and when you are outside the zone and walking hitters, teams going to force you into the zone. And then if you're over the plate, you're going to get crushed because the hitters are really good here. And what do you think the Rays are looking at when Chad Matola, their their hitting coach, goes over Anthony Kay in that hitters meeting ahead of the Blue Jays series? And they're going to say this guy was walking hitters at Triple A. Yeah. They're going to say he had a lot of problems with command there. And you guys need to be patient, and you guys need to wait for pitches in the zone. So this is, I mean, when when we can identify it, then you know that the Tampa Bay Rays can <laughs> identify it too. So they found this out, and they're they're going to be telling their hitters to be very selective. So that that creates the cat and mouse game, um, and it'll be on K to adjust and probably to attack right away. Yeah, because, anything. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, you know he'll he'll be anticipating that the Rays might be patient. Get in there, get ahead, strike two. Then you can use that curve or elevate the fastball. You're good to go. Well, and I like that approach from a guy in his first outing too. Is like, hey, you, these guys haven't seen me. Yeah, I believe in my stuff. It got me here. Put it on the plate. Let it eat. Exactly. As Russell Martin would say. Exactly. Um, and I, you know, I I am also enjoying that the Blue Jays are using their September call ups to kind of reward some young guys who had strong years like TJ Zoic. 
uh, Anthony K, Jonathan Davis. Like, instead of, you know, look, the Blue Jays have holes in their rotation. And instead of seeing those starts go to, like, baseball mercenaries like Edwin Jackson that you were saying before, you know, or veteran, like, you know, well-traveled dudes coming, you know, Ryan Fearbends and what have you, we're actually seeing, like, young players, homegrown in the case of TJ Zoic, who have worked hard this year, getting a little reward with some big league, not starts, should be starts, big league outings, uh, a little big league pay, per diem, nice hotel rooms. It's nice. I like it. Yeah, no, it is good. And I think, you know, when you think about the the journey that these guys go on for uh, years and years to actually make it to the major leagues, that's great. And there are also benefits, you know, that are harder to quantify. But there was a reason that the Blue Jays called up guys like Alford and Davis and Jansen and Barucki and Reed Foley late last season. And it was that they wanted to make sure that on opening day 2019, those guys were not going to be overwhelmed by the moment or overwhelmed by the the situation that they're in and they're again impossible to quantify but it does stand to reason that there would be some benefit there they're a little bit more familiar and k let's say he comes up next may and makes yeah. you know 10 15 20 starts for the blue jays well it won't be his major league debut at that point same with zoic and so even if they aren't in the top five on the blue jays depth chart they're they've tested themselves at the major league level and there is some benefit to that one last thing, I'm sure people are tired of me harping on this, but I, you're using the opener with these young kids, right? And the opener is a strategy that's meant to be used to like help you like win ball games. Yeah. And we have established that like winning and losing ball games right now really does not matter for the Toronto Blue Jays. They could lose every game for the rest of the season and it won't make a difference. They could win every game for the rest of the season and it won't make a difference. So why are you doing it? Is it perhaps, you know, that maybe you can save some money in arbitration down the line if pitchers have fewer starts? I don't like it. I don't see the competitive reason for it right now. I don't like it. Yeah, I mean, if TJ Zoic even gets to arbitration, that's a good thing for the Jays. <laughs> it is, honestly. Yeah, no, it right. is. So I think you kind of get there first. But yeah, it, I, I see what you're saying. Um, you mentioned Anthony Alford and Jonathan Davis, who have joined this club. Uh, the Blue Jays right now have essentially two outfields because Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is about to come back from yep. injury, missed about a month with a quad issue. So you look at in right field, Randall Gritchuk and his $52 million extension are in right, in center. Teoscar Hernandez, who has an 850 OPS since he came back from yep. his little minor league sabbatical. Derek Fisher, who obviously the club likes a lot, is also out of options next spring, so they want to find out about him. Those guys are pretty cemented in center. And Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is going to come back, and I have to assume play left field yep. almost every day because since he took over and left, uh, he has a 935 OPS yep. before he went down with injury. Pretty good. So there's four guys. And then on the bench, you got Billy McKinney, Jonathan Davis, and Anthony Alford, who is also out of options. It's a log jam, Ben. There's only so much playing time to go around. What do you prioritize as the Toronto Blue Jays down the stretch when you are looking at, was that seven names? Seven names three starts a day and late game pinch hit opportunities, this and that. How, who do you prioritize? What do you prioritize down the stretch? Yeah, I think also I would add Justin Smoke and Rowdy Tellez to this mix because I okay. think that you can... DH? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's like the one way to create a few more at-bats for these guys. I mean, ultimately, you just listed off the seven names. And so seven names plus the two um, Tellez and Smoke. So that gives you nine for a total of five positions. So you know that there are going to be a lot of guys on the bench on any given day. But I think if you rotate it through, then most guys are playing, you know, the regular guys are playing at least two out of every three. And your bench guys are playing, let's say, one out of every three, maybe getting into a game late to play some defense or pinch hit potentially, uh, depending on matchups. It'll be a juggling act for Charlie Montoyo. But I still think there's a way to get most of these guys in. And certainly, you want to play smoke most days. I think you owe it to him at this point in his career as he approaches free agency. Uh, you know, I don't think it would be fair to smoke to just entirely Russell Martin him and put him on the bench for the last month. No. Um, and if you were going to do that, the time was, you know, put him on waivers in August or release him in August. Totally. So I think now that he's with the team, they do have somewhat of a professional obligation to him to continue playing him. And he's also a good player. So smoke will play most of the time, but you can you can give him the occasional day off. Telez. You don't owe him anything. He has options next year. If he plays three times a week, that's fine. And I know he homered the other day, but I, I just, we talked about this last week. I, I'm not sure that Telez has forced his way into absolute everyday playing time for this team. 
And as for the other guys, I think it's a mix and match and see what see what happens. With Lourdes, you want him out there. Yeah. I think with Telez, I mean, the Blue Jays are obviously trying to figure out right now if he's ready to take over the first base job next season. I've already made my ter termination yeah. on it. I think yeah. most casual observers have. Yeah. Uh, I, internally, I don't know. That, that evaluation might still be ongoing. Yeah. They must like something about him. But like I, I think Rowdy Tellez, if, if I'm managing the Blue Jays, starts 2020 at AAA, yeah. and I am bringing back a Justin Smoke, or I am bringing in a yeah. Edwin Encarnacion or whoever, yeah. right? And I'm bringing in someone to play first base for me and leaving my DH spot open so I can cycle players through. But we've seen Rowdy Tellez go on hot streaks before, right? Last September, he hit a double every time he was up. Yeah. So we'll see. So, but I think he's going to continue to play. And like you said, Justin Smoke has to continue yeah. to play. I won't stand for it if he's not yeah. playing anymore. Uh, so really, like, DH first base, is, it's, not, it's not as much of an option, right? Yeah. Is Anthony Alford going to DH sure. at all? Do you think so over these final 22 games? Why not? Because you've got Justin Smoke and, Ta and uh, uh, Rowdy Tellez, plus you've got a lot of names on the infield, too. Where does Brandon Drury fit into all this? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think Alford is the low man on the totem pole. I think that on that outfield kind of depth chart, like yeah. he's seven of seven. Yes. Which is not good for Anthony Alford because he's out of options. Yeah. Maybe it is good for Anthony Alford. I don't know. It's not good for the Blue Jays because the clock's ticking on him. Yeah. They got to make a decision for him. Yeah. He's out of options. So the Blue Jays have these final 20 games to kind of learn more about him unless they've already made up their minds and said, yeah, this is how we feel about him. Kind of lukewarm about him. Like, yeah, you know, he, he had, you know, a lot of potential at one point. So the guy was top 100 prospect three years running. Wow. Top 50 prospect a couple times as well, right? Like, and has all the tools in the world that you want. Great makeup and character and all that stuff. Uh, but the Blue Jays might just say, it's not working out. He's only a year younger than Derek Fisher. You know, like, wow. he's getting old, right? He's yeah. 25. Yeah. Uh, he's out of options. Blue Jays might have already made their mind there. Maybe he gets traded this offseason. He comes back next spring and gets exposed to waivers at the end of camp. Yeah, I, I could see either one of those things happening, to be yeah. honest. Um, Alford as a potential trade chip to some team that wants to take a flyer, or you know they just play it out in spring. And this, that's the thing that you see with this front office over and over is they don't mind just letting something play out and then see. Yeah. You know, so with Telez, he'll come into camp with a chance to win a job, and they'll play it out. And you would think and hope that they would have alternatives there also. So it's not just Rowdy Telez, but. The same will apply in the outfield. I think they'll just let it play out with Derek Fisher and Anthony Alford and gather all the information and make a call on March 25th or whatever it is before opening day. Yeah, if you, like, just as things stand right now, 2020 outfield, yeah. Grichuk, Hernandez, yeah. Goriel, Fisher is your fourth, Yeah, basically. And so uh, Billy McKinney and Jonathan Davis will have options remaining. It's Alford is the guy. Uh, and I also wonder if the Blue Jays don't try to package some of these this outfield surplus with maybe, I don't know, another prospect or something to try to get some, like, current major league starting pitching. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you know, I, I don't know if it would be a trade for, like, a prospect or could be a trade for a guy on the cusp of someone else's 40-man roster right. who is also in a similar position. But there's got to be some opportunities, you would think, where, you know, it's like the Trent Thornton situation, right? Where Lemus Diaz became, you know, Trent Thornton. That's maybe the Blue Jays can do something similar to acquire somebody who will be in their starting rotation next year. Trent Thornton, I think, is the perfect example of the kind of pitcher the Jays should be looking to trade for. Um, you take a shot on someone who has pretty intriguing potential and he was going to be Rule 5 eligible and the Astros maybe weren't going to have room to protect him. So they have to do that same scouring this offseason for the Rays and the Astros and the Dodgers and the Yankees, the teams with the deepest 40-man rosters, and basically find the pitchers who are on the edges, try to acquire a couple. When uh, do we uh, get to dump on the Randall Gritchuk extension? I think now is fair. It's now <laughs> yeah, fair. I think now is fair. Looks bad, man. Yeah. It, it looks, looks bad. Yeah. Uh, and like, so the thing that I liked about that extension, to be fair, is that it's front loaded. So towards the end, like, I think the, the rate in the last three years, like nine and $10 million. If that's what you're paying for your fourth outfielder for a bench bat, it's not the worst thing in the world. Blue Jays can be a high payroll team. We've seen them run 160, 170 million dollar payrolls. Nine to ten million dollars, like that's less than Kendris Morales was earning, yeah. right? So it's not crazy, but it's just not happening for Randall Gritchuk this year. You know, we're we're we got twenty games left, and right now he's got a seven eighteen OPS, eighty nine OPS plus, so eleven points below average. Wow, 
284 on base percentage, man, which is like Pilar esque. Yeah, uh, I think you give him the opportunity down the stretch to keep working at it, keep trying to get out of it, right? Because he can't turn around without facing major league pitching, without being in competition. Yeah. Um, but you're you're tied to this guy, man. Like you you owe him 52 million dollars on an extension that you signed in April. It's looking rough right now. It is. Wow. 89 OPS plus. That's uh, that's not good. I think um, what I was reminded of when the Astros came into town uh, recently was that they have Josh Reddick, their own $52 million corner outfielder, yeah. hitting ninth. And I mean, that's maybe where Randall Gritchuk would exist on a good team on a really good team right. um, would be the number nine hitter and less of a hey this guy is like on the side of the stadium as one of our guys um, where you see him in promotional material around the team and he's kind of regarded um, as someone who who has the potential to to be a piece and clearly the extension reflected that but uh, he, he hasn't done it and so I think on the one hand yes he's a major league player and He's someone who can help the Blue Jays win games. You want him on your roster somewhere in some capacity. Yeah. But he's not playing like a corner outfielder. When you think about the way balls are leaving ballparks these days, yeah. 30 home runs. A. Eugenio Suarez has 40 bombs. <laughs> like, this is like yeah. what's happening in Major League Baseball. And Randall yeah. Gritchuk, I mean, he's just not doing it. No, he has 24 home runs yeah um in 545 plate appearances yeah uh and like the we're just not seeing the exit velocities that we were seeing in recent years we're not seeing the barrels that we were seeing we're seeing it at times we're not seeing it as consistently and that was always the thing that you dreamed on with randall gritchuk was like man the guy hits the ball so hard if he can kind of you know refine his plate approach get a bit more discipline chase less crap strike out less get hit you know pitchers into the zone hammer some of those fastballs in the zone Maybe this could really work out, uh, but he's also 28 now. Yeah. So like, it's got to happen now, right? Like, right. <laughs> you're you're entering your prime. You know, now is the time. Like, I sure you could have like a you know I don't know maybe break out at 30. It just yeah. doesn't happen that often, man. Like right. typically, like 28 in today's game, that's when it needs to be happening. And we are seeing some of the like peripheral numbers that you look to that kind of tell you that like oh there's something here are moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, and it's funny, you say entering his prime, the way aging curves are going in baseball, maybe he's leaving it, which is a crazy thought. Um, but you know, a lot of the time, the, the most productive years of a player's career is 20s. So that's not what the Blue Jays are hoping for with Gritchuk. Yeah, I still I still like look at 27 to like 32 as like prime, but like maybe I need to like move that back. For hitting, maybe. But yeah. I think as an overall player, your prime's definitely younger. Right. But the thing is, the Blue Jays have to keep paying them, have to keep playing oh, yeah. them. And that extension could end up right now looks like it ended up being a big mistake because now there is an opportunity cost to the fact that you are having to run him out there in right field every day and you can't say, well, you know, we've kind of soured on the guy, like we you can't non tender anymore or, or DFA. Yeah. I mean if they get if they get to the point in a couple of years where let's say Tay Oscar solidifies himself and Lourdes keeps hitting and Derek Fisher just breaks out. I think there's no problem with diminishing his playing time. Um, and, you know, you don't necessarily announce we're benching this guy, but yeah. you can diminish someone's playing time pretty easily. And if there are three better outfielders, then that's the way it's going to be. I mean, they'll have to do that. But I, I think we're a long way from that now because, honestly, they don't have three better outfielders than him. <laughs> so he's in there. <laughs> and he should be. Honestly, he should yeah. be in there every day. That's the thing with opportunity costs. There has to be someone better who yeah. could be using the opportunity. So, and you know, I think it's yeah. not, he'll play four or five days a week instead of seven in September, but you're not going to bench him entirely. Last thing quickly, uh, where do we sit on Teoscar Hernandez as the, uh, the season comes to a close? Well, it's funny, you know, and for much of the season, their numbers, Hernandez and Gritchuk, have looked pretty similar yeah. offensively because you have guys who are hitting well below 250 and their on base is hovering around 300 and they have some pretty good power. And in Hernandez's case, 20 home runs again for the second consecutive year. Grichuk also in that low 20s range. So their production is actually relatively similar. The perception around them is pretty different. Right. Um, yeah. Because Grichuk signed for 52 million. Hernandez viewed as more of an up and comer. The Jays are not tied to him. They don't really owe him anything. Um, but 
I, I do think that when you look at the production, as you mentioned earlier, 850 OPS since being recalled at the beginning of June, pretty good defense in center field. It's been a good year. It's, it, it started tough for Hernandez, but I think it's been a good year for him. He's never going to be a plus defender. No. Uh, <laughs> like it's just never going to happen, but he's going to be fine. You know, like I like I, I don't know if he's as bad as some people think that he is. Uh, he's hitting the hell out of the ball, man. Like he hits that ball hard when when he when he gets on it. Um, and I am encouraged by the numbers that he's shown since in terms of strikeouts and walks, like since his recall, excuse me, from his kind of minor league sabbatical that he went on there. The strikeouts and walk rates are better. The thing is, you just need to see it over a full season. Because we can't throw out the fact that Teoscar Hernandez was like unplayable over the first six weeks or however long it was before he was sent to Buffalo to work on his swing. You can't throw that out because if the Blue Jays want to be good and competitive and contend, they need players who can play every day and aren't going to have these like extreme valleys that it takes them, you know, two months to come out of. The production and the play has to be a lot more consistent. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point because the whole season does count, and so you can't just discard. Um, I know it's it's not quite the arbitrary endpoints territory because we're picking the stats from when he was actually recalled, so the endpoint yeah. makes sense, but it still doesn't erase the fact that he was really struggling early in the season. That's Ben Nixon Smith. I'm Arden Zwelling. Uh, this has been at the letters. Want to thank Shoali Ali for producing. Want to thank Anthony Memi for working the cameras. Want to thank all of you for listening. Talk to you next week on At The Letters.